Oh. Hi, this is Mike Ryan from Blog for Arizona. I'm here with Nancy Gutierrez, who will be running for LD9, the Democratic nomination in 2022 race in August. Uh, we're here at St. Philip's Plaza, which is actually a lot busier than we thought it was. So there's going to be a lot of people milling, by, milling around and walking by. So I apologize if there's any trouble with uh, with audio. Nancy, please speak up and project. I'll use my teacher voice. <laughs> All right. She's got one of those. Uh, Nancy is, in fact, a, a teacher at Tucson High. I'm going to have her introduce herself and give a little capsule biography of who Nancy Gutierrez is. Okay. Uh, well, I am Nancy Gutierrez. I live here in LD9. I am a teacher at Tucson High. I teach yoga full time. Um, I'm a wife and a mother. I have two daughters here in, in Arizona, senior at at U of A and senior at Tucson High. Um, I am running because we need a teacher's voice in Arizona. It's important that we stand up and fight for our public public education here in Arizona. And I'm also here because everything that I've done with volunteering and leading the National Organization for Women in Tucson, we are in a battle for reproductive rights, rights of women and children to get health care. So that's a tiny bit of me. Yeah. Oh, you were telling me about your, your husband is in the military. He was, or in, was the military. in the military. Yep. Sorry, yeah. He spent eight years in the military and when we were first married, he said, I'm going back in the military. And I said, okay, sure, let's do that. And then uh, learned a lot about military life and about military families and how they serve just as much as the person in the military. Um, I was, I spent some of my time uh, volunteering for the American Red Cross there and in military situations in towns, the American Red Cross helps um, the families who are left behind when the soldiers, you know, deployed, yeah. they help them with money and food and just resources. And so I volunteered as a um, volunteer coordinator for them and got to help families and just learn that process and learn how to deal with a lot of snow, which we don't deal with here in <laughs> Southern Arizona, which is a great thing. Yeah. But it, it, that time, um, we also he also served at Fort Drum, or I'm sorry, that was Fort Drum, Fort Huachuca. And just seeing different locations of, of army bases, but they, they all were dealing with the same hardships of having people gone and deployed and not being able to communicate with them and, yeah. you know, it, it was a great experience for me. Um, based on what I know of you so far, you've been a teacher for most of your career. Yes. Um, little yeah, children and adults, yes. you know, or near adults is the case. Maybe. Adults as well, yeah. yeah. And a mother and a military spouse. Yes. Um, how do those life experiences inform your political perspective and priorities uh, in political life? I think that all of those experiences really help me relate to a lot of different people. Um, as a military spouse, I saw what military families go through. And, um, and as a teacher, I've always um, gotten to see how Arizona treats our, our students and our staff and our families. Um, you know, in 1994, when I started teaching elementary school, uh, back then people brought their six-year-olds to me and said, are you old enough to be their teacher? They don't say that anymore, but um, <laughs> it's a different crowd. But well, I imagine it's the yoga, but you look great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> now I teach my students. When I tell you I'm 49, you say, oh, and they're pretty good at it. Um, <laughs> but but having that longevity of teaching since 94 in Arizona gives me a great perspective on what our lawmakers have done to our schools and how, uh, how the budgets have just been cut over the years and how the arts funding has been cut, the m and budgets have been cut, and how teachers are just, I mean, I think Arizona teachers have always been the best because we've always stepped up to do what's right for our students regardless of our pay. Um, but it's just, it's too much. And the volunteering I've done and the opportunities I've had have just given me the strength and the voice to learn from so many different people that I want to step up to the plate and, um, and do this on a political level instead of 
you know, heading volunteer organizations and, and being a department chair at Tucson High. Mm -hmm. Now it's time to take it to the state level. And what are the, uh, the issues, policies, concerns that you have uh, about these issue areas that you're most interested in that you think state government intersects with most importantly? Mm -hmm. Well, in, in education, I mean, our con state constitution puts a cap on what we can spend in, in education. Yeah, and voters, is, voters did that to themselves, unfortunately. But, yeah. <laughs> but it needs to be changed. Yeah. And I think voters need to be informed that that, that is, there is such a thing as yeah. a cap. Yeah, and it mm -hmm. was, what, more than 30 years ago, I think, yeah. now that they, so, that they did that. So it wasn't so, this generation No, certainly yeah. not. So we need to change that. Um, we need to fully fund our education. We have the money. We have a billion dollar surplus. So. Uh, certainly we could fully fund education and it's not just for teacher salaries I think people always go to oh teachers always you know uh, complain about not being paid yes we don't, we're not paid yeah enough. well when you can make ten thousand dollars a year or more in the, in the next state over you know exactly how, what incentive is there to stay in Arizona when you could make so much more exactly elsewhere? right and we should be paid more but that's not why we went into the profession no obviously it's not to get rich <laughs> <laughs> no but when we go into our classrooms two years ago I started the school year without air conditioning yeah. so 36 yoga students in a classroom with no windows with no air wow. it's not okay um, we have half of the classrooms in the building that I'm in at Tucson High are unusable because they have asbestos. Mm. But there is no money to fix that. Yeah. So we have teachers sharing rooms and, and moving throughout their planning periods because we can't use all these available classrooms. It's that kind of budgetary issue. Mm. Um, it's also, you know, elementary students not having PE, not having art, not having music. We have students that come to Tucson High and they don't know how to dribble a basketball yeah. because they have no PE. Yeah. So those are the, the education, some of the educational issues that I'm concerned about. Mm -hmm. But I'm also concerned for reproductive rights. Very Women much. deserve to be able to have rights over their own body and to be able to get the care they need. Um, we have one, maybe two Planned Parenthoods in all of Southern Arizona. That's ridiculous. Yeah. It's, it, that's not enough. And we need more. We need care for women. And not only when they're pregnant or when, if they don't want to be pregnant, but when they give birth. Yeah. They, so many women I see, uh, I, I volunteer for FCRB, the Foster Care Review okay, Board. Okay, yes. see so many women. Zero prenatal care before giving birth. It's crazy. And then zero postnatal care. Yeah. And you know, when after you have a baby, there's a lot that goes on that you need help with. And especially for mothers who don't have a support system of family and friends who maybe have gone through it before. That's one thing I realized um, in working with the Tucson chapter of now and just having my own children is don't talk about their true um, mental health after having a baby. We just don't, and we need to. Um, and and I know there is money. You know, there is money in the budget to be able to cover that care and to get young ones and kids underprivileged, under, um, you know, kids that don't have health insurance. They need health insurance. They need to be able to go to the doctor. They need to get vaccinated. They need, um, you know, help. So those are definitely huge uh, issues for me. And then along with, you know, just following the science when it comes to uh, conserving our water. I mean, we are low on water. We need to conserve it. And our other resources. We can't um, be ruled by large corporations without a care to our resources here in Southern Arizona. So that is, those are the things that I would work on and work for. But then also listening, I, I can't wait to talk to more and more of the people in LD9 to see what their issues are and what they would like their representative to, to do. Well, let's talk about that, that a little bit. Um, okay. What's, what's your philosophy regarding uh, and, and your your concept of the job of a representative of, of the people in our, in our state legislature? Well, I think our current representative, Dr. Randy Fries, mm -hmm. For mm, <laughs> another 15. 10 minutes. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and Pamela Powers and Hamley have done a great job of representing us. 
and I want to continue that legacy of care and concern. I think definitely as a representative, you need to talk to the people. I mean, it's not just about, you know, for six months you're in Phoenix, uh, on committees. The work that should be done by a representative is the work that the workers of this community. So I think reaching out to the community, I'm canvassing and talking to um, people and asking them about their issues and what issues are important to them, um, which is really what I've done as a high school teacher. You know, I listen to my students and I bring their concerns up to um, our principal and, you know, who is the principal in this situation? Um, Dr. Rodriguez. Oh, no, I or, mean, I mean, Mr. I mean in the comparison. Oh, in the, yeah. I see, sorry. Who is the principal <laughs> that you would be bringing those concerns well, to and, as a politician? I mean, in the committees, it's the committee chair, mm -hmm. and then it's, you know, the House. You can have bills, but then they have to go up to the Senate and, you know, the, the president of the Senate. So it's a lot of working together yeah. and... And that's the great thing that I've learned through all my different jobs and volunteering and, and all of that is I can work with lots of different people. And, and I do. I work with lots of people who don't share the same opinions as me um, because I can listen to them. Uh, I don't always change their mind, but, you know, I can try in a civil way. And that's the other thing. I think that we've lost a lot of civility in our politics. Yes. And because I'm a yoga teacher as well. I want to bring those yogic values, um, you know, of listening, of honesty, of care to our state. Um, those, like those don't seem do. particularly the yoga. Those are just kind of well, human Well, they are values. universal. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they should be universal. Yeah, they should be, but they haven't been. I mean, it's, it's someone asked me um, the other night, you know, how will you deal with that toxic? And it has, it does seem toxic um, environment. And I think, unfortunately, I've dealt with a toxic environment for the past couple of years in education. And I think, you know, I know for me, my yoga practice and my meditation practice helps me not take things personally because it isn't personal. You know, it's not toxic towards me. Um, and that makes me more effective in being able to get a job done and um, and work hard for it instead of getting, you know, sidetracked by the toxicity. So that is my plan. And screaming into a pillow sometimes. <laughs> and, you know, ice cream. What about the uh, the public advoca advocacy part of the job? You know, getting up in front of cameras and talking to the press and so forth yeah, like absolutely. that. Yeah, absolutely. How do you feel about that? Well, I feel like if I can, uh, you know, go into high school in stretchy pants in front of 36 students who may or may not be, uh, have wanted that class and have them do all sorts of things with their body on a daily basis, it's been really great, great practice. Yeah. So being in front of adults is pretty comfortable for me yeah. <laughs> actually and I've been teaching yoga for in Tucson since 2009 so that's you know getting up in front of people every day um, and sharing a message mm. and listening and being able to um, be calm and cool even when some people have you know differences of opinion so I, I feel like I'm ready for that yeah. Well, what other concerns do you do you have that you think uh, the state government is, should be addressing that maybe they're not doing so adequately? Well, I think that um, I think that we need to be a lot more transparent in uh, in the lawmakers and what their interests lie. For example, um, lawmakers who are on the boards of charter schools. Conflicts of interest. Yeah, it's a lot. It's a huge conflict of interest. I don't think they should be making the rules about charter schools and money. That is a huge conflict of interest. Same with um, private prisons and, you know, funneling money. I'm not, I, I think, you know, our, our prison population definitely needs money and to be, you know, treated humanely and, and education, of course, is key, but I don't think that that money should be going into the pockets of, you know, private people. Yeah, not only running the prisons, but running the healthcare system is uh, the prisons. There's a, there's a lawsuit pending right now regarding that. Yeah. And that's, that's not okay. It's not, um, I'm losing my word. It's, it is legal, but it's not ethical. Yeah. And it needs to change. Yeah. 
So, what? A, I mean, have you always been a Democrat, or have you evolved politically at all? What's your attraction I have to the Democratic Party? Definitely evolved. <laughs> so, I grew up in a Republican house. Yeah. Um, my parents were both Republican. My mom, my mom, my dad passed when he, I was twenty-one, um, and he always called himself uh, fiscally Republican and socially Democrat, but he was a Republican. Yeah. My mom is still a Republican, but two weeks ago said to me. I don't think I'm a Republican anymore. <laughs> yeah, that's uh, increasingly common, unfortunately, is the uh, Republican Party uh, evolves toward an authoritarian fascist cult. I, and, but I was happy to hear that she had, because we've had conversations for many, many years about politics, um, and so to hear her say that, I was, I was like, oh, wow. Yeah. I'm so, I, you know, I didn't take any credit for it, of course. Um, but, so I was an independent for many, many, many years and um, became a Democrat four years ago. Even though I've been voting Democrat as an independent, I became a Democrat. And yeah, being an independent is a very comfortable place to be. You don't have to really declare allegiance or Correct. anything. You know, you just vote for who you think the best candidate is. Right. But I, I wanted to be a Democrat because I wanted to be able to work for the party who was putting people up that I agreed with that had same values as I did. And um, yeah, so that's that's why I became a Democrat. And, you know, now I've been to um, political parties and uh, making friends with people who work in politics through now um, that have, my, my good friend Chesney Richter has said to me, when are you gonna run? Yeah. Let me know. When are you going to run? So now I'm saying now. So I'm lucky to have a lot of smart people yeah. on my side. So have you ever had any experience in a, you know, with a campaign before? You worked on a campaign, volunteered, anything like that? Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah, we all got to stay hydrated. <laughs> um, just in little amounts, you know, signature gathering and that kind of thing. But I, I really haven't. I've been working in different ways in a political area, but, um, and through things like Red for Ed and Save Our Schools, those kind of areas. The issue areas. The, the issue areas. Right. Yeah. So this is my first time um, volunteering for a campaign and being in charge of a campaign. Yeah. So there's a big learning curve and I'm ready for that. You know, being a teacher, I think the best teachers are the best students. And I've always been a student, so um, it comes naturally to me, and, and um, it's exciting. I really like doing my homework. Well, the specifics of the campaign brings up the the issue of uh, there's a, I think, uh, let's see, day after tomorrow, there's going to be a, a, an election among the elected PCs of LD9 to yes. send a slate of three, three possible candidates for yes. appointment to Randy Freeze's seat for the next, the, ne the coming term, to finish out his, his term. Um, but I understand that you're not participating in that or you don't want to be uh, one of those appointees. I don't want to be one of those appointees and I took, I really um, took some time to think about that because it is an important decision to make. Um, and the reason I decided not to, and I spoke to Chesney and I spoke to Pimlin Powers Hanley about it, um, I have committed to this entire year of teaching. Yeah. and there are no substitutes there are no teachers so i really don't feel yeah. like yeah. you would I be able to walk focus. out I, yeah. I, my student i mean i would have to quit yeah. and my students would not be able to take yoga um and my daughter is a senior at Tucson high and i don't want to miss the last few months of her in high school living in my house yeah. she's going to be at nau next year and um that she is my priority and I just don't want to miss it. I don't want to miss being, I get to be on the field when she graduates yeah. and, um, yeah, well, and I that's don't think my you, priority. Yeah, I don't think you could be faulted for that. I mean, personal and professional commitments, you yeah. know, come first. And Dr. Fries has taught us that by, you know, Absolutely. resigning not only from his congressional run, but from the House in order to yep. focus on those things. So, yeah, it, you have to be fully committed. I mean, it's a part-time legislature, but it really is a full-time job. It's a full-time job. And I'm fully committed to campaigning. Mm -hmm. And it will give me more time to meet the people of LD9 and talk to them and campaign. And then next, when I, the, the primary is August, and I've already talked to my principal and staff about um, 
starting the school year in August and then hopefully being elected in November and then walking away in December. But they'll know that and we'll have that whole semester to find uh, a replacement for me. So I feel much better about yeah, that. It makes a lot of sense. Um, let's talk a little bit about uh, the, the last couple of years. Uh, the last two, three years, uh, I gather from our conversation, has really disturbed you in a lot of ways. Yes. Can you talk about that period of time and how it's informed your political commitments right now? Sure, yes. Um, the last couple years particularly have been horrific for women and women of color in particular. And that has really... Um, maybe want to run even more with, I mean, nationally in politics, you know, without having a Violence Against Women Act. And... Uh, yeah, I was shocked. Uh, I mean, you, the VAWA has been, you know, bipartisan re reaffirmed. Yep. And now, not a single Republican would vote for it. No. What the hell? I, that is a good question. It's, it's criminal. I mean, truly, it, it's, they should be ashamed of themselves but I don't think they're capable of yeah. well given how many of their of uh, how many of their Senate nominees are you know uh, very uh, credibly accused of domestic violence yeah, I violent. guess it shouldn't surprise any of us it should not. <laughs> um, so that has been horrific um, in our state you know just well overturning what voters voted for with Prop 208 and, you know... The, the, you want to be more specific about that? So some Prop 208, some sure, not be sure. Familiar. Proposition 208 um, was uh, supposed to give um, some tax money to back to public education. So <clears throat> we, uh, you know, Red for Ed was a charge to get... Um, get that on the ballot so that we could kind of go get funding in a roundabout way instead of you know the budget as it was we could get money from um well, a tax on the to, highest yeah. to be perfectly frank it's the you know the republicans keep cutting funding and then you know maybe putting a little bit of it back but you know they, but, they yes. have caused us to fall to 51st in the country uh the very bottom of the barrel in education for people. Funding. And they're thrilled about it. Yeah. They, they consider that a huge victory because yeah. it's been their agenda for many, many years in Arizona. So Prop 208 was giving money back to education and in the last days of the budget, they basically overturned it with the flat tax. Um, so, you know, and 70%, over 70% of voters voted that in. So yeah. literally smacking the faces of yeah. the voters and what they wanted. And yeah. that was passed in a bipartisan way. It wasn't yeah, just we Democrats. know better. You can't tax the rich. <laughs> yes, or, or rich corporations who don't pay any tax in Arizona. So um, those things, uh, Not um, Pamela Powers Hanley just had a podcast about um, the money that's in the hopper for that could be used for women and children um, and health care and insurance and that's just sitting there and it's not going to women and children yeah, yeah. And it's uh, just a, a programming note here you just scroll down a bit and uh, blog for Arizona and you'll find that <laughs> podcast it's really good um, and really informative and you know every expert there is says that we need prenatal and postnatal care we don't get it um the fact that uh you know really in arizona only half day kindergarten is funded uh if your school is not a title one school it's half day kindergarten so then parents have to subsidize that with a pretty high tuition to get their kids in school for a whole day of kindergarten a lot of people can't afford that and don't necessarily aren't zoned for um, a Title I school. Um, not even to speak about having pre-K in the budget because all experts on education say that if kids were in a pre-K program they would do even better in kindergarten first all the way through college. So it's it's an investment. It's a it's marvelous investment. investment in families and, and human capital. It is, and especially for our our poor or poorest children and our children of color. 
they need to be fully funded and their parents need to be fully funded and they're not getting it in Arizona and they're getting it the exact opposite. So in Catalina Foothills, we always pass our bond issues. We always have the extra money for you know um, computers and technology. However, there are buildings in the Catalina Foothills district that are falling apart and that's because of the state budget. So even in the one of the richest school districts, they are still dealing with these budget cuts because there's no way the private people can subsidize that. Yeah. So it seems to me that it's almost a political pacifier for some of the more uh, I don't know, middle class, upper middle class people who, who might otherwise be outraged by the conditions of public schools, uh, that they are able to do these bond overrides in their own district and invest that money, uh, whereas so uh, districts who don't have that option or can't get that option funded, you know, don't, don't have that extra fund. Yeah, it Absolutely. seems extremely inequitable to, to me. Does it strike you that way? It's extremely inequitable. And if you look at which districts, you know, I think it's Amphi hasn't passed their last overrides. That could be wrong. But I, as memory serves, it, they just can't get them passed. And no, I voted for it. I live in oh, oh, Right. I mean, <laughs> you know, people like us always vote for them. But a lot of voters either don't understand what they actually are for, um, but we need to educate them. And, we, and really, we just need to fully fund education with the billion dollar sur surplus that's there. And then we wouldn't need budget overrides. I mean, that's really the truth. Yeah, but is even a billion dollars enough? I mean, you well, know, given that we're 51st in the country, I mean, a billion dollars yeah. seems like you know, chump change in comparison to the, the investment that we really need. I agree, and if we used money, if we taxed the largest corporations in Arizona, we would have the money necessary to fund yeah. education. And it's we been really estimated would. that uh, there's 10 to 15 billion dollars in special interest tax breaks in our tax code, that we're just leaving that money on the table. Right. Every year. need to be looked at and and go away. So Nancy, one of the uh, things that you know certainly concerns me and may concern you as well is uh, the way that higher education has been so severely defunded uh, in the state of Arizona, not only, not only our community colleges, but our, our colleges and universities have, have yes. been severely cut back. Uh, do you have uh, thoughts or plans for that that you're going to advocate for if you're elected? I do, and this is near and dear to my heart because I have a senior in college right now and have been paying her for tuition for four years. Yeah, and, and when in high school, to about to go to college. Yeah. <laughs> yes, she'll be at NAU next year. And and fortunately, they both had partial scholarships, which definitely made it easier for, for us as a family. But, um, you know, and my older daughter ha is graduating actually a semester early because of all her AP credits. And we were fortunate to be able to do that to, for her to use those. But not every student has that opportunity to pay for those AP credits. And not every student is an AP student. So I think that there are several things we can do to make college, um, we need to fund our, our colleges in Arizona. We need to have scholarships for students that um, aren't just at the top of the class. Uh, students should be able to afford college. Um, I think there should be more uh, partnerships with community college and high schools to offer dual enrollment classes so that students going to high school can do that work but also graduate with several credits already that they got for free. And then vocational education is so important because not every student is going to be a college student. And vocational education, you know, students need to be able to go to high school and, and learn how to weld and learn how to work on cars and learn how to be a plumber and do those jobs, hands-on jobs. And graduate high school with a certification. Yeah, and if you've paid for car repair or plumbing or electrical work recently, you know these people make a great living. <laughs> yes, they sure do. And I admire them for the work that they do mm -hmm. because yeah, I can't too. do any of it. No. So those programs have to be funded and they need to be funded by the state because we can't privately fund that. Um, and there are, you know, not every high school has those programs. And I think we focus so much on the AP credits, which it's those work they're great but that's not every student and then also um, we really need to help first generation college students you know students whose parents didn't go to college they don't they don't necessarily know how the application process works they're not sure what to do and these students they need, you know, they need help and our 
schools don't have enough counselors. They don't always have a college and career counselor that is at that school for the seniors. And we need to fund that. Um, it, it just everywhere in education along the lines has been defunded. And it seems that, I mean, there is such a thing as a school to prison pipeline. And in our state, unfortunately, um, you know, the Republicans in the legislature want to give all the money to the prisons because their friends, you know, are owners in them instead of educating our, our youth. Or to privatize, uh, ir you know, unregulated and, you know, unsupervised uh, charter schools. Absolutely, because the charter schools don't have to, they don't have any of the regulations that our school has. They don't have special education students necessarily. They don't have they English can, as a second language. They can language refuse students. to enroll anybody they like. Exactly, and they do. And people don't know that. And, you know, in a public school, first of all, I think that's what is a beautiful thing about a public school is we take every line. Yeah. And everyone can have a value at that school. So yeah. I have students who come into my classroom and they don't speak any English. And they don't always speak Spanish. You know, everybody yeah. assumes that it's Spanish. Well, it's not. No. It's Arabic. It's, mm -hmm. you know, it's people are, we have refugees from Africa. We have lots of languages. I think Catalina School in TUSD has 200 languages spoken. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, these kids need help. Long ago, when I was first teaching in Arizona, uh, they took away bilingual education. So students were coming to Arizona and not being able to speak any English, and they weren't allowed to speak in their native language to learn. So then we were creating illiterate students in two languages. Yeah. And yeah. that's what we've done. But in a charter school, they just don't deal with that. They get the state money, mm -hmm. private schools they too. They skim off the cream and leave the rest. They yeah. sure do. They don't take the state tests that we are mandated to take, even in a pandemic year. And that was simply to crush our spirit. I mean, really, truly, that was the that was the reason the governor mandated that we take it last year. Um, of course, our kids lost some ground. <laughs> but guess what? We got them through a pandemic, and we we tried to teach them. And sometimes the teaching was just simply looking at them on a camera and saying, "How are you?" and and what's going on. And you know. I think there can be value in charter schools for some kids mm -hmm. because I know, you know, a large public school isn't the best for every student, but we have to have those regulations for them. They can't take our money, our tax money, without having any of the regulations. It is, it is unjust. Yeah. Um, so yes, we definitely need that reform and we need to fund our, our state colleges because they have been completely gutted. Yeah. And tuition keeps getting higher and higher. Way above the rate of inflation. Yeah. Absolutely. And Multiples. it's really difficult. You know, parents are deciding can we retire or can we pay for our kids' college? Yeah. And you know, my husband went in the military to pay for his college, but not every not every kid should have to do that. You should want to do that, and that's great. I have students that have gone into the military to do that, and I support that. But that shouldn't be a have to to do that. So, yes, it's college or it's education from K, and it should be pre K all the way up through our state universities. We need help. So, what do you think about uh, the role of money in our politics? What are your thoughts on that? And well, and I suppose in that question is, will you be running clean, traditional? I am running traditional. Um, I was thinking about running clean because I believe that that is a great way to run. And I was advised by many people, um, an Arizona list advised me as well, that um, because Republicans changed the laws of clean election, if I ran clean, I wouldn't be able to use the Democrats, um, all of the resources of the Democratic Party, which would put me at a disadvantage. And so I decided to run traditional. However, um, I do think, I mean, money, well, when we looked at, look at Kirsten Cinema, who is taking uh, private money left and right and holding you know, us hostage, basically not passing um, 
not prohibiting the filibuster and, and it, we're at a standstill because she's taking all of this money and not fulfilling her promise to voters. So money, we need money. I need money to run, which I'm fighting out. <laughs> um, but it doesn't need to come from uh, corporations who want something for that money. That's, yeah, I mean, ideally it should come from the, the families and people who live in your district. Absolutely. And that's who it's come from um, uh, because I have started my campaign and I am fundraising and um, it should come from voters and family who live outside of the district. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take family money and friend money as well. Actually, my very first principal uh, donated to my campaign, which really just warmed my heart because yeah. it's been quite a number of years since I worked for him. Yeah, you really find out who your friends are when you, you really run for do. office. And that yeah. touched my heart. I was really, really um, just, yeah, because I was such a new, I was 20 three years old when I started teaching and taught for him and um, and just spent two years in the Scottsdale School District so it, it was it was a nice uh, lift. Could the state of Arizona specifically the, the government you want to be a part of do more to, to help regulate or moderate the influence of money in our politics? Absolutely I mean we can we can definitely regulate that, but I think we have to have a Democratic uh, majority in the House and Senate to be able to do that because the Republicans are never going to do that. They will never give up that money. And so then you look at equity and how do we you know, win as a Democrat if we're not taking all of that corporate money and, and um, that puts us in a, in a really tough position, which is what they want, right? Yeah, they're they the got us in a health mess and they don't, they're not going to let go. Right. <laughs> so we really have to work hard to elect the Democrats to our state Senate and House because we're, we're just in a losing situation and we've seen that with human rights, with you know, reform, with education, with the health care. We just aren't going to win because none of the Republicans Maybe I shouldn't say none. It seems like the majority of them have no interest in talking or having conversations about this at all. Yeah. At least that's what I've heard from my friends who are uh, elected officials right now. What, uh, what role do you see in our state government, um, specifically your role as a state legislature, in protecting people's constitutional rights? How do you view that? Well, that's really important. I mean, we have a constitution and everyone has rights under that constitution. So as a state legislature, legislator, um, it, that it would absolutely be my duty. And are there areas that you see as more under attack that need the most attention? I do. I think that the rights of um, people of color are often not looked at as um, their rights. I think that when we have, um, you know, Arizona with uh, SB 1070 and, and all of that ridiculousness with being able to pull people over based on their color um, is at a direct attack on people's rights and isn't constitutional. Um, also, how how we treat people, well, the rights of women who are being abused, um, it seems that they have no rights. I mean, you know, they can make reports and then their abuser goes right back to work, goes right back to everything that they want to do on a regular basis, and it's the, the women and children who are often left with no money, no rights, no help. Um, so I would definitely work to make those people have know their rights, first of all, and then make sure that they're, they have those rights. Another area of uh, traditional concern of, uh, of state governments is public safety. I mean, there's a lot of deference uh, to, to state governments in setting public safety policies. Um, what what are your thoughts and, and concerns regarding uh, public safety, especially as regards uh, policing? Yeah, well, we definitely need police who are much more informed about uh, basic human rights and how to treat people and that we don't have to always pull a gun on people in a traffic stop. Uh, you know, we've seen all over the country 
unfortunately, um, people who have died in police custody because they were treated um, inhumanely. And that is not acceptable and should not be tolerated in our local police and, and border patrol, honestly. Um, so, Which, to be fair, the state government doesn't have control of. I, but we could still, I mean, we can still express we can influ influence yeah. and, and voice our concerns. Um, but that, so training and, and vetting, I mean, we should know if someone is a, is the, a member of a hate group, mm -hmm. they should not be able to be, to serve as a public, um, a police officer. A public protector, yeah. Right. Um, we have this debate in schools because, you know, schools, uh, are just they reflect you know the society and you often have police in your schools we absolutely I mean, public, have police yeah, on yeah, public campus school officers. and yes we all want to be safe on our school campuses but there is a big debate on whether more police officers really make it safer or do they instigate hmm, <laughs> more violence because um and i've spoken to my students about this what they feel and they feel like more more police officers on campus make it feel like they're in a prison mm -hmm. and students of color make it feel like they they feel like they are being watched and targeted just because of the color of their skin and I can I, I see that they share that with me and it's it's a problem so I think that our, our police force needs to be much more um, reflective of the community that they are serving. I think that if you are serving a community that, um, you know, are mainly uh, Latino and speak Spanish, then the police force should speak Spanish. And because when you know your community, you are much more effective in helping the community stay safe. Yeah, they gotta trust you. They exactly. And I don't think there's a lot of trust in the police right now. Yeah, especially and with, in minority with communities. good reason. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So I think that kind of recruitment would be beneficial. Um, but it's it's a huge problem and it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of coming together to solve it but it, it needs to be solved well another area of public safety that is you know central to to the states is is the the issue of gun control and firearms and second amendment rights yes. uh, and certainly uh, you're going to see a lot of republicans who are like rah rah second amendment you know right uh, so what are your thoughts and feelings about uh you know efforts to to control and regulate firearms in the state of arizona well, I, I mean, it is in our Constitution. I believe in the Constitution. And um, I worked with Moms Demand Action uh, with the National Organization for Women. And I think they really have a great platform that they're, it's not about, um, you know, taking all guns away. I, think, I believe they're a responsible gun not. owner. I'm a gun owner. Right. My husband is a gun owner. Yeah, well, yeah, he kind of had to be for a while. <laughs> <laughs> he had to be, and, you know, and he chooses to be, and he's safe and, um, you know, teaches other people how to be safe. But I don't think that we need, I mean, like a few years ago, several years ago now, Arizona decided that you didn't need to take any classes or have a, a license to have a concealed weapon. That's yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. I and used I've to be a CCW holder and, you know, now I don't have to have one. And, you know, any idiot can carry a gun without any training whatsoever. Yes, concealed. which is yeah. ridiculous. Yeah. And, and that has nothing to do with the Constitution. That has nothing to do with the right to bear arms. No. So that immediately, I think, should... Uh, be looked at. You yeah. should have to take a class. Of, I think it was a three-day course, mm -hmm. yeah. and you had to, you know, show that you were responsible. Yeah. Um, I don't think that the Constitution was talking about automatic weapons mm -hmm. when it talked about no, right to muskets. Arms. Really, yeah. <laughs> um, and so I think there is a way that you, people can be responsible and uh, and be responsible gun owners, but I don't. I think it's gone way too far. Yeah, um, there's a certain vision of uh, second Second Amendment maximalism here in Arizona that has gotten out of control. I mean, they want to carry, you know, firearms in public buildings and well, hospitals and emergency carry them on school property. And school property, yeah. Uh, just, I think it that was just last seems year insane that to me. that was, um, you know, in in the the hopper that, um, you know, that parents could come on campus or, or making teachers carry guns. Oh. <laughs> yeah. 
I mean, that's as dangerous as it gets. Yeah, plus, where are you going to put it in your yoga tights? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. <laughs> but, you know, it's, it's a big issue, but it needs to be. I mean, we have to do something about that in Arizona because look at all. I mean, there's gun violence all the time. And if, you know, we have to have regulations. And yes, we have some waiting uh, periods, but not in the gun shows. And that's their loophole. You can go to a, a gun show and buy something, no background check, no, no nothing. That easy. That is not okay. That has nothing to do with the yeah, that definitely needs to be closed. So. Well, let's talk about public health a little bit. Okay. Um, you know, that's also a, an area of traditional concern in the states and localities um, that uh, the, the state legislature has a lot of say in. Um, what, you know, given the experience we've just all been through for the past almost two years now, what are your thoughts on, on public health, how it can be promoted and enhanced by, by state action at the, at the state level? Um, public health is of the utmost importance. And of course, we've seen that because, uh, and because people need to be able to go to their doctor and learn what is scientifically true about vaccines and, yeah. you know, yeah. just basically health. Um, I think that we definitely need to be able to ensure young kids so that they can go to the doctor when they need to um, and they can get, you know, dental. I see so many kids that don't have access to the dentist or they have to go to Mexico to get access to dental care. And that, that's... That's not okay. They yeah. should be able to get yeah. This is the first world goddamn country. It is. Um, and we need to act like that. Um, so I, I definitely think we need more access to health care for everyone. Everyone should be able to be insured in the state of Arizona. Um, <clears throat> and that that is a priority. We need to be able to do that. Um, you know, it's such a it's such a tricky um, situation with insurances and, and you know large hospitals and or, or large groups that you know um, are kind of eating up all of the private or small doctors' offices. And um, my doctor's office basically had to become a part of a large group because they couldn't afford their insurance anymore on their own. They couldn't afford insurance for their own people that worked in the doctor's office. Oh, yeah. So it wasn't just like a malpractice insurance. No, it was, it was, it was they providing health insurance even, for their employees. Correct. Yeah. And, I, and that, um, I mean, they still are providing good care, but I don't think they're be able to provide it as they would want to. You know, it's much more about numbers and getting people through than it is about necessarily being able to take the time that they would want to with their patients. Mm -hmm. And that's that's not okay. Doctors put in a lot of time and effort to become a physician. And, you know, their first rule is do no harm. They want to be able to spend time with their patients. And we need to... Um, reform the system so they can so it's not just as many people as you can get through the door yeah. we need quality health care and we need health care for women we need reproductive health care um, we need people to be able to get abortions if they want them um, and we need young women to be able to get birth control if they want it and that is not easy for young women to get um, I <laughs> I do teach yoga, um, and you know, in TUSD, they just adopted a newer um, sex education curriculum that talks more about actual, real sex education um, instead of abstinence only. However, not every teacher teaches it that way, unfortunately. But um, there, we we also teach about sex education in yoga because it is yoga. Um, and it is always astonishing to me how much young people do not know yeah. and how misinformed they are. Yeah. And that's very scary. Yeah, you shouldn't be getting your sex education via TikTok. <laughs> no, you shouldn't. And not everyone takes yoga or takes health education with the health teacher that will teach that. Some yeah. of them teach get health with someone who teaches abstinence only, yeah. which isn't the whole picture. Yeah. Um, 
Given your experiences over the past couple of years um, as a teacher, uh, I'm interested in your views on the intersection of public health and public schools, especially as regards, you know, COVID protocols and protocol prevention methods, but also the, the more recent uh, attack lane that uh, the Republican Party seems to have opened up on public schools in general, and specifically as regards curriculum and, you know, this nonsense of critical race theory and, you know, now, I guess, advocating burning books, uh, of all things. So uh, do you have uh, thoughts and insights on that that you'd like to I share? I do. <laughs> I have lots of thoughts. Um, well, the curriculum of the schools should be up to the school, school boards. That is their job. It is not the state's job to demand or even say what each district, you know, uh, teaches. So they are overstepping in a huge way when they say that. Um, you know, critical race theory is taught in law school. Mm -hmm. I can vouch for that. I went <laughs> okay. to law school and yeah, Thank we did you. talk about it once or twice. Um, should we teach the truth about our history as a United States? Yes, we should. Absolutely. Um, Including we, the darker parts. Into, yeah. Well, if you don't, um, who said if we don't know our past, we're doomed to repeat it? Uh, Somebody was. Kind of like that. Yeah. <laughs> That's a rephrase. Um, but we we have to teach that. And we call, I mean, TUSD does a great job, I think, of culturally responsive teaching. Yeah. Well, for many years, they were under attack for their Mexican American Studies program. Yes. Yeah. Huge attack. And, and still are, I would say, to a certain extent. And those are classes that students have to opt into. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to do more culturally responsive teaching in all classes um, and we're trained on that as teachers but obviously um, we need more of that and we need teachers who are willing to teach that way because some aren't and we've definitely heard that discussion uh, time and time again um, because I teach yoga I'm really lucky to be able to teach about current events and and have a very diverse student group so they've actually taught me a huge amount about their cultures and I I think that's one of the best things that that I have gained from my my being their teacher is learning but we can always do a better job of that and um, you know but schools need to do that we have to teach the truth no longer can we teach you know that the pilgrims and the Indi Indians uh, came together and it was a happy family situation you yeah. can't do that anymore because I don't that know is maybe a lie. maybe some families uh, you know practice genocide inside the family <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, we have to teach the truth. Um, as far as public health, you know, a lot of schools don't even have a nurse on their campus. Yeah. We share nurses, which yeah. is ridiculous. We share school psychologists. We don't, we have, at Tucson High, we have two social workers for 3,300 students. I think we have nine counselors. It's insane. Our kids are dealing with trauma. Yes, because of the pandemic, but also because they are in households just like every other school district where they deal with trauma. And we don't have enough people to help them. Teachers have tried to help them, but I'm not a trained social worker. I'm not a trained psychologist. Um, so I do what I can, but then also I have that secondhand trauma from them. And there is, you know, TUSD just in instituted. Um, that any employee or student or um, family can get free um, mental health help, which is phenomenal. That's one district. Yeah. We, we have to fund that so all the students. I have students who you know are um, transgender. I have students who are really questioning and don't have family support, and it would benefit them so much to be able to talk to a professional, talk to um, a health provider about that. But when the nurse isn't even there the whole day, how do they do that? You know, they just don't. Um, and as far as COVID, I, I feel very grateful to work in a district that has mandated masks the entire time. Um, but that's rare. Not most school districts are not mandating masks. And we've seen what that does. And take Verde, they're shutting down elementary schools. They should be shutting down high schools because they have as many cases. Um, you know, and the people that were trying to say kids don't get COVID or they don't get it as badly or, you know, it's just 
ridiculous. It's not scientific and it's not true. So we're seeing kids with long-term effects and those kids bring it home to oftentimes their grandparents or, or people that are immune compromised. So, you know, and, and teachers are in that position where we're not supposed to technically give our opinion on vaccines and we're not supposed to be in the middle of this. I mean, I do because I tend to be a person who speaks now. Uh, so I, I give my students information about vaccine uh, clinics and about uh, the scientific facts of the side effects and, and all the benefits, but, but not all teachers do. Yeah. Um, are there uh, areas of concern or interest policy-wise or politically that we haven't touched on that you are going to be emphasizing in your campaign uh, through the next nine months or ten months? Um, well, definitely education is my number one, so Thanks. I've talked about that, and um, reproductive rights and, and the environment. I mean, I really do feel like we have to, I mean, we are in a climate crisis. You know, it's it's November 13th and it's 80, 88 degrees. 88 degrees. It's lovely, but you know, maybe I mean, not quite I mean, I wore right. the sweater because I want it to be fall, <laughs> but uh, I'm sweating. So that is something also that I, I, we have to start listening to scientists. We have to make changes. We just, we have to, we have no choice. Um, I want my daughters to be able to, to live here if they want to and not be, have it be so not hot be that they can't. climate refugees. Right, yeah. right. Um, so those are the main uh, ideas that I will be focusing on on my campaign. Um, but like I said, I'm in the beginning of my campaign and I am learning and doing my homework as well. Yeah, and uh, I will inform viewers that Thanks. Nancy has uh, informed me that this is actually her first ever political interview. Uh, yes, it sure is. <laughs> <laughs> so I want to I want to thank her for coming and uh, enjoying uh, uh, some time with me and some time with you, my viewers, and uh, hopefully uh, you do well in your upcoming campaign. And I wish you all the best. Thank you, and thank you so much for your time and you, and your listeners' time. They really appreciate the, the voice. You're very welcome. Thanks for joining us. Thank you.